Hi, I'm Tim Ellis. Thanks for joining us for Laneway Live. Tonight, we're off to the UK to meet the Magic Circle's 2008 Magician of the Year. If that doesn't ring any bells, he's also the very first person to ever fool Penn and Teller. Please welcome John Archer. Good as your April Fool's trick. That was my favourite of all time. But uh, but uh, yeah, very good. I'm glad you enjoyed the April Fool's trick. We got a lot of uh, very positive comments on that. It was very. It was one of my favourite magical April Fools ever. I think um, I loved it. I um, how many how many views did it get? I have no idea. I have no all idea right. how many yeah. it got. It was. Uh, I think it's, it's, got, it's got a niche audience anyway, hasn't it? So it's only sort of magicians really who are going to be watching it. So very niche audience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's never really going to go viral um, with magicians. I don't know. It's it's. I, I think it's a slow burn because I'm still getting people who are writing to me going, I tried to watch your video, but I'm having trouble getting it. The, it, it just seems to stop at one point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. But, uh, you, should, you should just just keep doing them until people get sick of the fact that they all stop. Well, I could... Sorry, carry on. <laughs> it's okay. No, um, I don't know what happened there. Uh, yeah, and that was in 1973, and then it's been great ever since then, really. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Now, originally, of course, uh, you were not a magician at all. You were a police officer. Yeah, 10 years. Although that's a long, long time ago now. It's 20, 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, 24 years since, since I left, and I, I did it for 10. So, Were you doing magic uh, at the same time as being a police officer? Uh, I was, yeah, yeah. I, I had it, I had it passed. After I'd been in the job about five years, I got it passed as a business interest because obviously, if you if you have a, another job when you're in the police, you've got to make sure that it doesn't conflict. There's not a conflict of interests or whatever. So, you probably couldn't own a betting shop or a, a bar. But um, I, I was the first person in our police force who got a business passed as a business interest. Our chief constable always said no to everybody. But they made me school liaison officer um, oh. because they knew of my magic skills. So they the made me school liaison officer after I'd been in five years, which was made a lot of the other police officers quite bitter because it's not that was like a really cushy number that people got at the end of their career. And I got it after five years. And it, I just went into schools and did PR for the police. So I'd, you know, I'd bring in the police dogs and the... The, the motorbikes and the cars, the police horses, and I do talks on um, crime prevention and forensics. And but I, I, amongst all of it, I did magic tricks. Um, you know, and I'd spend a week in one school, and the kids would get to know me and uh, and learn about it. So, so I was so I applied for a business interest and basically blackmailed the chief constable. I said, "You are using my skills that I've learned and spent money on." for your gain, but you won't let me use that for my own gain. <clears throat> and uh, so he then passed it as a business interest, um, reluctantly, but um, so, so that, yeah, so that, so I was doing, I was doing magic in my job as a police officer. And then I also was sort of out just, you know, just doing silly little gigs. I didn't, you know, I had an income. So I was in that position that a lot of semi pros are in where the, you know, earning money from magic doesn't matter. Um, you can just do what you, you want to do. And yeah, it was pocket money. You know, uh, I loved it. It was great fun. And in a way, uh, you probably had more time to rehearse then than you do now, because I know when you have a real job, as it is, yeah. you tend to you, you tend to use your time very carefully. And so you'll sort of say, okay, so from when I get home, I'm going to spend two hours rehearsing magic. And you do. 
Whereas if you're doing yeah, it yeah. full time, yeah. And also, when you when you when you're doing it full time, it, it it does become a job. So when when you're not when you're not gigging and traveling and working, you know, your spare time is right. I'm gonna I'm gonna have some time off and you know do something else. So, um, yeah. You, you but but also you sort of it sounds silly, but you don't need to rehearse as much because you know four or five times a week you're out there in front of a live audience doing it um and there's nothing better than actually doing it for real um you know to to keep everything up to speed so um you know i i now only really rehearse things that, apart from I, I sort of close-up magic is a hobby for me still i don't do close-up magic at all really you know performance wise for, for money or gigs so that's my hobby so i, I when i when I'm in my office or at home and I'm not working, sometimes I'll just play around with coins and cards and, uh, and that's fun. But the, um, the stage stuff, I only ever really practice and rehearse stuff that I know is going to go into the act. I don't, <clears throat> I don't mess about with anything unless I think this, this is going to have legs and go somewhere. And that sort of attitude has, has served you well because it was only two years after you left the police force that you got the Ken Dodd comedy trophy. Yeah, 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 you're right. I did. I don't know how that happened. I mean, I, I got it before some people who definitely deserved it more than me. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, yeah, that was that was a Blackpool Magic Convention. I think they've stopped doing that now. I think they've, since Blackpool sort of reinvented itself, I think they've, uh, certainly this year, and possibly last year, I think the last person I can remember getting it was Paul Zenon. I think, uh, yeah, I think he, he he was the last one to get it. Maybe two years ago, you know. So most people around the world have no idea who Ken Dodd is or what sort of influence he had. Uh, do we just hear about this guy who would sort of do an hour and a half of a three-hour <laughs> comedy show? At oh, he should, uh, yeah, he he shows. If you ever went to see him, I mean, they overran by hours. I can remember going to see him once in a <clears throat> in a matinee, um, and there was a show. His evening show started at seven. I, I went in at about two o'clock, and we came out at about eight o'clock. And <clears throat> and the seven o'clock audience was still queuing outside to get in to see. And then he started that show late and probably got until two in the morning. He, um, yeah, he was he was known for uh, you know going on and on and on and on. But I mean, he had phenomenal amounts of material. Um, and huge respect from you know, all the comics of the time, uh, and even 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 a lot of the modern, you know, the, the new wave of comedians that came around from the, you know, I mean, he started in the fifties, but the sort of new wave of comedians that came around in the eighties when all this, you know, so-called alternative comedy started, uh, they still held him in high regard. I mean, he might have got out of fashion for a while, but he certainly, you know, when he died, he was still held up as, you know probably one of the greatest comics we've ever had. And, and so you uh, won the comedy trophy after only two years of doing magic full time. I assume yeah. you, must, you must have been you know, using comedy all through your life. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think if, you know, if you want to be good at comedy, you've, you've got to, I mean, people talk about comedy boards, you know, people having comedy boards and it beating them. I think, I think you have to, you have to think comedically, you, you know, there's certain people, I, and I'm annoyingly one of those people who in conversations, if I, if, you know, if I click a funny thing, I'll, I'll go in. I'm, I'm terrible at just having serious conversations with people because if I see a joke, I'll go for it. And, uh, and I've, I've always been like that really, you know, since I can remember, you know, since uh, as far back as like seven or eight year old, I can remember being at school and, you know, being the, the joker and the idiot who, you know, if there was a funny thing to be said, uh, I'd say it. And, you know, I just love the sound of laughter, really. And uh, uh, so, so, so yeah, I've, I've always been that guy. I've always been, um, you know, somebody who's gone for it. And th there are comedians who aren't like that. There are, there are, you know, people who are great comedians who just turn it on when they go on stage and are very, you know, straight and serious off stage. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly not one of them. I'm annoyingly, constantly <laughs> making silly comments. And every, you know, one out of seven will hit or something if I'm lucky. One out of ten. And the rest of them, people just stare at me and go, shut up, John. <laughs> um, but, you know, just being that 
that type of guy is you you know you only hit one out of ten times but you remember those times and and they become bits that you use in your act or um you know you, you, it's like it's like a muscle it's sort of uh, you know if you if you if you lift enough weights it gets stronger and it's the same with the comedic brain you if you're constantly looking for things you you start to realize when it's a good one and when it isn't and you hit more than you miss and so yeah it worked out i mean before the before the um the comedy award the ken dodd comedy award we did me and mike smith entered in fact i was still in the police we entered an ibm competition with a, a an act called archini and smith uh and we won a comedy award for that and that that was like a victorian uh, escape act um sort of with me in a like victorian bathing costume and mustache and bowler hats and it was i thank you i'll be out in seconds i'll be out in minutes i'll be out in days somebody call the fire brigade it was all that sort of uh nonsense and uh and we we won um like i say i, th I think we were theodore cup or something and a comedy world um and then we got we, we sort of got quite a lot of magic conventions off to the back of that um doing this little double act and then I also start, was doing stuff solo. For, then I left the place and was doing solo stuff as well. So I'd, I'd sort of made a little bit of a um, a mark in the magic world in the UK. Not a big one, but I think people had slightly become aware of me by by the time the Ken Dodd thing happened. Um, then you uh, then you got the Champion of Comedy from the British Magic Awards in 2000, the Carlton Comedy Award in 2002, and then you went to America and got the Senator Crandall Comedy award uh, at Abbott's. So yeah. it's just like knocking them all off one by one. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I think that happens with a lot of acts. I think a lot of yeah. acts appear and um, there's, all, there's all these awards available. And a lot of times they're struggling to think who they can give them to. And suddenly some, somebody new appears on the scene and it's like, yeah, we can give them it. And so you, you tend to, uh, you know, you, you sort of, you see, I see it. I see new people appear on the scene and, you know, they're getting awards and recognition and, you know, appearing in all the magazines and then and you suddenly the the latest thing. And, and I, I, there was a period when that happened for me, when I was sort of the, you know, the new kid on the block. Even though I started quite old, really, I, started, I didn't really, I was 35 when I left the police force, 34, something like that. And um, so, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a youngster by any means, but I, uh, yeah, there was a period where I was the new British comedy thing for a little while. And, you know, I, I got booked. I probably did too much. I was, I was doing every convention and, and there were, you know, there were more conventions then than there are now. There quite a lot of them have mm. died down or disappeared. So, um, so you had to yeah, keep turning I, out I, did, I, I did have a little flurry of, uh, of things. You had to keep churning out new material or was there act as known? Uh, no, no, the thing is, I, I sort of, because I'd been doing it for 10 years when I was in the police, I'd sort of got quite a reasonable backlog of material. And, I, uh, and then the, maybe that first five or six years full time, uh, I, did, I did churn out quite a lot of material. The thing is, I, was, I wasn't doing comedy clubs or things. I was doing mainly... Uh, private parties, charity events, uh, private social dues, fundraisers, where I was the only, I was the guy. So they booked me to do the night. And for some reason, I'd sort of, I started off saying, yeah, well, I can do 245s if you want, with a break in the middle, which which I didn't think was, you know, I thought that's a reasonable night. If they want the, me doing the full night, I thought that's all right. You know, that was an hour and a half. And then they booked me again a year later, and I think, I've got, to, I've got to do the same for them again. They want two forty five, so they saw me last year. So I'd have to do. So I very quickly came up with about three and a bit hours material. I probably, you know, I've probably got about four hours worth of material now I could do. Um, what is you know really really strong out of that four hours is probably an hour of it is what I would consider, you know, the best. But but yeah, I did I did get quite a lot of material quite quickly. And then uh, now I don't. I, now it's quite slow adding things. I had, I had new routines, maybe one a year if I'm lucky. One every two years <laughs> takes a while to you know now to. To get things, M mainly because I, 
when I'm trying to work out new stuff now, I don't want it to be like the stuff I've already got. Mm. So I think, well, I've already got a, a routine, a card routine that uses two people. I've already got a, a routine where people draw pictures and I tell them what they are. And so I can't do that type of thing. And I've already got a trick where I, you know, I predict numbers that people. So, so you look at it and go, well, I now need something that doesn't feel like all the other stuff I've got. Mm. And there aren't, you know, there aren't a lot of um, variations that, especially when, when I, I have quite narrow um, sort of guidelines of what I want to do and what I don't want to do. I don't want to use, uh, not because I think there's anything wrong with it, but just because of who I am and my character and, and how I look on stage. I don't want to use things that look like magical props. Um, so I wouldn't want to use, you know, uh, any big illusion boxes or anything like that. Um, I don't really want to use silk handkerchiefs because that feels like it, it's a prop to me. It, you know, I'd use an ordinary handkerchief. Um, I'd use books and paper. Um, and also I want to use things that involve the audience as much as I can, which is going to be a nightmare for the next year or so. But um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I have my, like my own little parameters, which I think everybody does. They, they sort of, if you've been performing for a while, you get to know yourself and you, people often come up to me and I'm sure they do it to you and they do it to all magicians. They'll say, I've got a trick that would really work for you. And, and, and they write it up for you, they send you it and you go, do they really know who I am? There's no way I would, you know, there's no way I would do that. But um, it's just that they don't know what the workings of your own head and you sort of, you know, we all know we see a routine and, and we can imagine ourselves immediately doing it and we see other routines and we just think, no, I can't imagine doing that. Well, now that, and then uh, the other thing, yeah. Sorry, God. Uh, the other thing I have as well. I will let you get a word in soon. You so I'll, I'll relax. Spinny wheel. Just put the spinny wheel on your side of the screen. Um, I. Uh, the other thing is the sub tricks that I've seen somebody do so well that I don't think I can better it, and so I don't want to do it for that reason. You know, like um, Bob Reed's knife through court. I love the knife through court. Um, concept. I think it's a funny, you know, getting a guy up, sticking a knife through a cut. There's lots of things that are just, before you add gags or anything, that's just a funny idea. It's a funny concept. They're funny for the audience to watch. You, you're naturally going to get funny reactions from the guy. Um, you know, it, there's lots got going for it before you even have to routine it, you know. But I've seen Bob Reed do it. And, you know, I just loved his routine from start to finish the whole you know, the whole thing, sharpening the knife on the, the little pan and and everything. And even though he's, you know, sadly been gone for a while and, and that routine for a lot of magicians, new magicians wouldn't, won't even be aware of it. For me, I still feel like I, I, I don't want to go there because I think I'd, I'll never really better that. I want If I do a routine, I want to try to do a routine that I feel like um, I can make it my own and, you know, and it not be the best version of that trick out there, but certainly be uh, one that uh, is me. And I, I just, you know, so sometimes I see tricks and just think, I could never do that because it, it feels like it belongs to somebody else. Yeah. So I was going to ask. Oh, did you have a question? Yes. You mentioned, you mentioned about the, the parameters of coronavirus coming in and maybe we can't bring audience members on stage. Maybe we can't do this. Maybe they're going to be different rules. Do you think, now bringing in a different set of rules is going to at least inspire a bit more creativity for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think short term, certainly that, you know, and I don't know what short term is, but, but it certainly, certainly over the next year, 18 months, uh, it's, it's going to have to be different. I, I do think we will get to, you know, be in contact with people again. I, I, I do think it will go back to normal ish. I think we will return back to a, a life where audiences sit next to each other and get up and we can give them a deck of cards and say shuffle out of the game. I think that'll all return um, because, you know, eventually, uh, you know, there'll be a, there'll be a vaccine and, you know, it'll, it'll, it, it will be different. But for, for the short term, the, the next year or so, then yeah, people are going to, if there are going to be audiences, you're going to have to think, mm. you know, how, you know, how you interact with them and how they interact with each other. I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle of um, a, a tour. I, I started a tour at the beginning of this year called 
ironically against the odds. Um, I never realised how apt that um, that title was going to be. Although I did see a poster of uh, Pete Thurman uh, is, is touring at the moment as well. His po poster is um, um, job vacancy available or something because he, he does a trick where he gets a member of the audience and they become his assistant and it's uh, Pete Thurman and the amazing dot 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 or something. I can't remember the, the exact title of the show. But I saw his poster it said, um, you know, vacancy available. I thought that's another ironic post. But... Um, but yeah, I'm in the middle of this tour. I, mean, I was looking at the material that is in the tour. If I, you know, if I went back, say I went back, but they had social distancing rules and audiences had to sit two seats apart and mm -hmm. you could do a show or whatever. Then there's, there is so, you know, all of my routines are me involved or multiple people involved, you know. And, and you sort of, you know, you wonder whether... You know my envelope routine, blank night, the the pen and teller thing I did. The um, I mean, just that getting them come up, and giving them an envelope, and taking it back, and then somebody else coming up, and you know, I've got a bit where you know I'm giving people paper and pens to draw pictures, and two people coming up to blindfold me and examining everything. And you just sort of think, you know, how would you, how would you get around that? Could you do it at all? Could you know? Could it be done? Um, you know, they come up, you give them rubber gloves, you give them disinfectant, you ask them to stand their feet away, you say, you know, pick that up, check it, wash your hands. Pick... You know, I mean, it could be very funny. Um, but it, it's be, funny once. It's only the first time, they, first time. Yeah, they exactly. It's funny yeah. once, but it's not funny with every routine. <laughs> so, um, so you sort of think, well, which routine will I, will I use that, <laughs> that mechanism of ridiculous distancing? Uh, and the other routines, you, you sort of just, you think uh, you just have to get on with them. Um, so yeah, it's you know. Yes, it's in So so what is it like at the moment over there uh, in London? I assume you are in London right now. No, I'm, I'm in the northeast of England, so I'm about two hundred fifty miles north of London. So, oh, uh, so, so uh, what is it like where you are? Uh, we are um, pretty much uh, you know in lockdown, so we stay at home. We're allowed out to exercise, which obviously means I don't go out at all, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're allowed to go and get essential items shopping wise. So we can go to a supermarket. Yeah. Uh, and we can go out. They sort of recommend half an hour to go out and exercise. Um, but they don't want you congregating in parks or large groups. You know. mm -hmm. So so it's it it is it, we, we got three weeks of lockdown and then that three weeks was extended to another three weeks about a week and a half ago, I think, or maybe two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I think we got about another week of this, yeah, probably about another week of this second lot of lockdown and then they're looking at uh you know an exit strategy of how, how they do it but uh, how, how is it where you are how's australia pretty much the same uh except for the fact that we've i think we've only got uh 60 or maybe 70 at tops deaths for the whole country wow um yeah. and uh we we did start late we had a situation where they were going to do the lockdown but it was on the weekend the Grand Prix was supposed to start in Melbourne. And so right. the premier was like, we'll do, we'll do lockdown on Monday. And people were like, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, we do lockdown now. <laughs> but he'd already let a lot of Italian people come in for the Grand Prix. And oh, wow. guess what? Uh, the Italian team or some people from the Italian team were diagnosed with coronavirus. And so the whole thing just immediately shut down after that. And uh, yeah, yeah. And then we had the Pop Comedy Festival cancel. And I think you've had Edinburgh Fringe cancel as well. Yeah, Edinburgh Fringe has been cancelled. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah every, everything. Everything really that's happening over here is cancelled. Um, you know, all live sport. Uh, it, sport isn't even happening behind locked doors. There's nothing at all happening at the moment. They're, um, the mayor, you know. That, there, there was some, uh, we, some hilarious ideas for sports. Um, there was one 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 organization said they want to have the basketball teams competing in empty arenas but to do it they're going to get all the basketball players to share a hotel and they get tested every day and and it's like someone went so basically you're keeping the entire nba hostage the yeah. prisoners to entertain yeah. us and then the uh, the guy Dana White, the head of the UFC, said, "I'm going to do. I'm going to get the UFC going again. We're all going to move to an island, and everyone's going to be tested before they go on the island. And we're just going to have cage matches and broadcast the cage matches from there." 
so there's been some very creative <laughs> options suggested. Yeah, it is. It is madness. There is a lot of madness going on, isn't there? But uh, we all know the secret: drink lots of Dettol, and you'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> now, you also write yeah. a lot of comedy too, so I assume there must be some uh, some opportunities to get some some topical material going. Yeah, do you know what? I haven't. I've done the odd little, you know, comedic tweet. But it feels like, it almost feels like everybody's doing it, you know, mm. so it's almost, Too easy. it almost feels like doctor jokes at the moment. It, it feels a little bit like everybody's doing coronavirus material. Yeah. And inevitably, you know, people are all coming up with the same, you know, the same type of gags or sort of the theme of gags, like, you know, forgetting what date is or, you know, you know people doing things about, their, you know, the hair. Um, and you know, or, the, or you know, not shaving. The, the, the sort of um, the, the, there's lots of like well-worn routes that everybody's going down, and so so I, I don't really feel that inspired to sort of try to sit down and write coronavirus stuff. I, I just sort of you know, if a thought comes into my head, then I, I sometimes just tweet it. Like a thought came into my head, I, you know, literally my my. You know, I've got an Apple Watch, and it's constantly saying it's time to stand up. And you know, that just was funny to me. So I did a tweet about you know, about that, and uh, and very you know, various things have you know just sprung into my head, and I thought oh, I'll tweet that. But uh, I'm not really, uh, I'm not really writing it. And, and and also the other thing is, if the danger is if you write a lot of coronavirus material, potentially you know, in two years time it could feel very old oh yes um, you, you know it, it, you know if, if we're out of it and back to normal it suddenly feels old because everybody's done it mm. i tend to try and write material that is um do, you know it's not topical at all so it doesn't rely on uh, you know uh, people knowing a, a situation or names uh, you know characters personalities I, I try and just write stuff that that'll work no matter when just because i know i'm going to use it for the next 20 years well, i'm um, going to put your twitter handle down below so people can sign up and uh look forward to receiving random tweets from you. yeah yeah no i don't i, I don't I, I do have random thoughts i, I had a random thought today actually which i was going to tweet which is uh and that I, I can't, I haven't quite worded it, but it was, uh, I, I've noticed that as, as I've been getting older, I tend to we sitting down a lot more than I used to, which is annoying because it really messes up the sofa. And, um, and I haven't, that needs wording, but, um, and the word we, I mean, I, I should be brave enough to, to use a stronger word, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, always clean. You're, you're a shy, even shy, shy word, little flower. Yeah, yeah. So even the use of the word "we" feels a bit naughty for me. <laughs> I mean, only my, you know, off stage, I'm terrible. I'm foul mouth. But, um, <laughs> but there's a certain British sensibility that has always gone through the humour, which is a very reserved thing. That's that's charming. It works really well. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because you know, people see as reserved and charming. I mean, I don't think any UK audience, any UK magician who knew me would describe me as retiring and reserved. Maybe Guy Hollingworth, but certainly not me. But 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 it is funny that you go, you know, you can go to America. I don't I don't know how it is. I've only been Australia once is when I came and, and did your yeah. festival of course. But um but certainly in America sometimes I yeah they do sort of see me as a bit reserved, I think. Um I don't know how they can see me act like that because I'm you know I'm a you know I pick on the audience, you know relentlessly um you do. On stage. now your your, yeah. most, your most recent um exploit was uh going on britain's got talent and yeah it was very controversial for some bizarre reason yeah yeah why was it controversial um they they they, they had this crazy story going on oh no he's a professional oh yeah but you know what they, they do that with everybody um i, I think the news I think Britain's Got Talent probably, you know, slip all of this information out to the newspapers because, you know, all publicity is good publicity for them and yeah. they just want the show being talked about. So, but, but it's no secret. I mean, it's no secret that all of the acts, it's, it's yeah. not, BGT don't keep it a secret. Britain's Got Talent don't keep it a secret. They, you know, they invite people to take part and they want 
they want people who are going to be good and they want people who are you know just you know a granny from leads who tap dances the one all of those things and they uh, also and don't it. don't mind if you're not british either no they don't in fact you know there's a huge amount of acts that that sort of jump the got talent circuit and do you know italy's got talent and then france and then britain and then they go across and do america's got talent um and you know and the different got talent franchise people get in touch with them and say we'd like you to come and do ours it's, I mean, a, bit that, like the, it's a bit like the magic convention circuit yeah, it is very much like the Magic Convention circuit. Um, yeah, you go, you, we'll give you the comedy award if you come and do ours. <laughs> it's that type of thing. So, um, but yeah, there was a bit of controversy with that. I mean, to be honest, it wasn't, it wasn't an awful lot. It was a few things just said, oh, he's already done this. Um, and then, of course, I did the semi-final and did the, the lottery prediction. And that, there was a bit of controversy in that as well, because the closed up, close up on the ticket. And I think one of the numbers was 16. And on the ticket, they could only see the six. And the thing is, the one was actually just printed quite faint. Yeah. Uh, and on this yeah. Zoom, the one didn't show up. Um, but it was a 16 because the guy read, you know, deck yeah. read it out yeah. and it was it was 16. But uh, but, they're, but they like all of that. They like, you know, they like all of the fact. And did you enjoy the experience? I know you were very nervous going on, but did you actually enjoy the whole thing? Was it worthwhile? Yeah, I, I uh, for for me it was. I, I don't think it necessarily is going to be for everybody. I know some people who did it this year and uh, and they had you know bad experiences uh, and wish they hadn't done it. Um, whether they'll get shown or not, I don't know. But um, for for me, it worked out sort of how I wanted it to work out. I wanted to go out and look good on my audition, um, and then you know I got through this the semi finals, the live semi finals. Uh, and that was more exciting for me because I knew I wasn't going to be edited and I knew I could, I, I knew it could flow. That My audition was quite tightly edited. If you watch it, it is very tightly edited. And I was, I was shown right at the end of the run of audition shows. So mine was the last audition show. And then the very next week, the semi-final started. So I didn't have much time. You know, if there were things I could change about it, I would change. I would, I was switched. In the semi-finals, I was switched from the Friday to the Wednesday, and I was swapped uh, with um, X uh, Mark Spellman, who was going to be in the Friday. They swapped us over, um, and I think I'd, uh, if I'd stayed in, if I'd, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to refuse to switch really because it's not my choice. But um, they did ask me, and I sort of said, "Yeah, fine." I, I should have probably said, "I'd rather stay in the Friday. I haven't got much time to rehearse." Blah blah blah. I, I could have tried to make, stay there. I think if I'd have been in the Friday semi-final, I'd have stood more chance of getting through. The Wednesday semi-final, I was against a golden buzzer and the guy who eventually won it and um, a kid band who were great. I was in, it was a tough semi-final that I was in. And, you know, if I'd have known who was in each one, uh, I'd have said, can I stay in that other one, please? But, I mean, you, you know, it's, it's not the John Archer show. It's Britain's Got Talent and they're in charge. They're making the show, not me. Um, so you, do, you, you ha if you go in that show, you have to go in knowing that um, they're not going to make decisions based on on you all the time. I mean, I, I think for some people to do. I mean, the guy who won it last year, eighty nine year old, you know, Chelsea Colin pensioner, Colin Thackeray. Um, uh, you know, for hi for him, I mean, they, they obviously, you know, they loved him, and he sort of he's got all the military links, and you know, they love they love kids, they love military links, they love, you know nationalism and you know anything that's british so uh, there's certainly you know um sh the show some people off more than the show other people off uh, yeah. but but yeah. again you know that you know they're making the show and it's their program so that that's that's how they should do it you know um so that, uh, that, so that that's not your you know only tv credit though which is which is fine because you obviously, as we all know, you are famous as being the very first person to fool Penn and Teller back in 2011. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, first person to officially fool them. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure lots of people have fooled them beforehand. But, um, <laughs> but they're the first person to get that official title. Um, yeah. Although I haven't got a trophy. I haven't got a trophy. The annoying thing was that, that, that special and the first series, they didn't have trophies. Oh, they haven't retrospectively given you one? No, I know. If somebody could personally write a letter to Penn and Teller saying, I'd like a trophy, please. Uh, I have offered to go on again and fool them again, but unfortunately, um, I think I'm too old now. You've got to be young and trendy. <laughs>
um, for the new for the new series. But um, yeah, that that was that was great. It was me and Ben Earl in that very mm -hmm. first pilot special, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was amazing. I, I mean, it was very different to if you went on the show now. I think if you you know if, if somebody goes on the show now, they know how it works. They know they're going to be made to look good, and they they know some some people go on there knowing they're not going to fool them. They don't go on to fool them. They just go on to get seen, and a, a, a nice it's a good clip for your show reel, etc. When we did it, the show hadn't existed. Nobody knew what it was, and we all thought it, it could be a bit like Britain's Got Talent, where they're just going to make us look terrible. And um, and and also the other thing was is. I, you know, when that, when that show was coming about and they were starting to ask people to do it, of course, all the magicians in Britain, we all know each other. So we all talking to each other and emailing and the general and chatting to each other on forums. And the general consensus was, there's no way you can fool Penn and Teller. You know, they sort of, you know, they know, they know how everything is done. Um, and then, and then the show happened and, you know, and they were lovely to all the acts and made all the acts look good. And then, Lo and behold, you know, I managed to fool them, and uh, and it was a big shock. I think it was a big shock for everybody, especially that I fooled them with such a, a relatively stupid little bag night routine. Um, so yeah, it was great. That was really good. And was um, was that uh, instrumental in getting you on to help my supply teacher as magic and undercover magic, or were you already involved with those projects? Yes, it probably was. Um, to be honest, uh, yeah, it, it it could well have been. I mean, it was Anthony Owen that um, Anthony Owen that got me, you know, in the um, Help My Supply Teachers Magic, and I'd already done something with him before Pen and Teller Foolers, which was a thing called Undercover Magic for Sky, which sort of, to be honest, it, it wasn't as good as it should have been. Uh, there was still some very nice stuff in it, and that was a, a it was a team magic thing with. Me and uh, Mark Paul and um, various others. I'm going to forget the names, I, but anyway, you can Google it. Um, so, so I'd done this. Um, I'd done uh, that undercover magic thing, and was that a, uh, a hidden camera type of a show? Yeah, 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 very much. And one aspect, one aspect of that show, we we did a little bit where. It was hidden cameras in lots and lots of different places, basically. We were like a team who went out and did hidden camera magic. And it was based on a few other hidden camera type magic shows that had happened beforehand. And it was, um, you know, it was just a British attempt at doing something similar. Um, but one strand of it was uh, in a classroom where I pretended to be a teacher and, and did a little bit. And when, when Anthony was pitching this school idea, he used that those clips from undercover magic as part of his pitch document to pitch it to um cbbc um and so then when they were putting the team together they thought well john has already done it and it, it worked and he, he you know he, he pulled it off um so we'll approach him so I, I was approached you know along with the other guys and uh and got involved with that so you know whether whether the pen and teller thing had any bearing on it i, I suppose anything you do that just you know makes you pop up in someone's memory is good. So yeah, it, it certainly won't have done any harm. And so now that you've got all of this amazing material behind you, what is in front of you now that, I mean, you were, you were in the middle of a tour. I assume you also had yeah. other projects in the pipeline that have, have been postponed. What, what are we looking no, for? Not a lot. Um, <laughs> not a, not not a lot. Well, to be honest, I am, um, I'd already agreed to do a second tour next year. Um, a, a different tour, but similar sort of thing, theater, small theatre tour, just maybe about 20 dates. So the plan was to finish this one this year. Then later this year, I'm supposed to be on tour with um, a comedian friend of mine called Tim Vine. Who you um, always tour with? Uh, well, he's my best mate. So I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've supported him or opened for him uh, on tour for about the last 14 or 15 years. Um, he's doing he's doing a, a tour called Plastic Elvis, which is not a... Not a it is sort of a comedy tour, but it's a, it's a parody. It's, it's like a, an Elvis Presley parody of this character called Plastic Elvis uh, with a full backing band. So he does about an hour and 15 minutes of him singing Elvis songs in a PVC gimp suit um, and a wig and makeup. Um, and it's, in between the songs, he talks and slightly, 
you know, self-deprecates the whole thing. Uh, and it's funny, but the music is very, very good. The band is brilliant. And he's got a reasonable voice. Uh, so I was going to be opening for him. In fact, I still will when the tour eventually happens, but it's been postponed. Um, as a character called Big Buddy Holly. So I wear <laughs> glasses and a Buddy Holly wig and bow tie. And uh, I played uh, electric, a small electric um, ukulele replica of a Fender Stratocaster that Buddy Holly played. And I do Buddy Holly songs and slightly take the mick out of it as well. So it's all sort of, oh, well, little things you say you knew. And it's all, oh, 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 oh. it's all that type of thing as I'm singing. Pegasus, <laughs> Pegasus. So, um, so that is um, what will happen after my tour. And then the tour that was planned for me for next year may still happen, but it'll happen later next year rather than the sort of January, February time, which it would have been planned for. So everything's just been put back. Um, other than that, I, you know, I spend a lot of my time just going around still doing the sort of, private parties, social events, fundraisers, charity things, corporate events, just anything and everything that comes up. The very rare odd little comedy club, if it works. And you know, so magic conventions. Obviously those sort of things have, have stopped now. So are you just relaxing at home or you're using the time in a creative fashion? Um, but I'm not being as creative as I could be. I'm not, I don't sort of get up every morning to think, right, I'm going to work on stuff. I sort of, I try, I try and, I try and have a bit of structure to my day. Otherwise you, you just, you know, so I try and I come in here and this is my office. I've got all my, over down that end, all my bookshelves and everything. And um, so I, I try and come in here most days. And then I'll normally have a couple of days where I don't come in here. So it feels like, sometimes the weekend I won't come in here so I feel like I've got a bit of a working day even though I might not work I might come in here and play my ukulele play poker online and chat to some people but usually I, I do something every day um, I'm editing videos for some people uh, I'd like to write a book uh, I've always wanted to have a book eventually so uh, every now and again I'm going and, and writing up a routine and also I do all the illustrations myself so I'm I'm sort of doing the illustration. So I'll, I might do that for a few hours. Then I might play around with, you know, a deck of cards and just faff about. Um, so so I try, I'm, I'm sort of mixing it up a bit. And then, you know, I'm doing things around the house, although there's hardly any jobs left to do. Um, you know, I've tidied every single drawer in the house. My office is, you know, tidied. <laughs> Bookshelves all got tidy. I spent two days tidying this place and... Uh, well, we're going so, yeah. to we're gonna have to put you uh, put you to the test and say we we want to see this book by the end of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know what? Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. But I, I sort of yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, you need I can the, write. You need. I can write, but I find it hard work. It's yeah. not something I particularly enjoy. It's work. When when I write, it's it's work. It's sitting down and you know working. So. Uh, it'll certainly be nearer to being finished by the end of the pandemic. Um, thing is, I want to, you know, I, I can't, I don't think I'm going to ever do a book again. So I'm 60 this year. So I've always thought I, I didn't want to, I never wanted to rush into a book. I've always thought people who've been in the business, you know, six years and they write a book. I sort of think, what experience have you got in six years that, you know, I sort of think I don't want to write a book until I feel like at least, even if I'm wrong, at least I've, at least I'm convinced that I've done it so many times that maybe I'm right. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, if I do it, it want, I want to have everything that I think about magic in there. So as well as routines, you know, I want to try and put everything I've ever come up with. Sometimes they're just routines of, you know, for a trick that already exists. Sometimes it's a new trick. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also want to put in thoughts about performance and, you know, audience management and all of those little things in between as well. So which other people have done, um, but just from my perspective. Um, you're wetting, you're you wetting our appetite for this book already now. So you, you, it's, it's like you're teasing <laughs> about this, this. It's sounding better the way you're describing it. So Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe I'll come and launch it at Melbourne Magic Festival. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what we'll do. And you, can get a, you can get a first edition signed from me. So if, we, um, if, we, if we book you for Magic Festival, you'll have to have the book ready. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah well, don't book me. Don't book me too early then. <laughs> Look, it, it has been so good to chat with you and catch up with you. And I know it's, uh, it, 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 it is frustrating sometimes uh, sort of sitting here in lockdown. You're, you're describing my day as well. Yeah, um, I'm yeah, yeah. having to do these, uh, these interviews that I ridiculously committed to doing every single day. But uh, no, do you know what? It's great because lots of people are doing these, aren't they? You know, lots of people do that. Are so weird. much content. It's great. There's so much great content, but I don't know if you want, have you watched any of Ben Earl's little chats that Ben, ben has been doing? All right, Ben does a, Ben Earl does a little chat on Instagram, you know, and he's chatted with lots of great people, yeah. all, all the greats really. Um, and he just sits and chats to them live and, and he leaves it up for 24 hours and then they're gone. So you sort of, you can't go back and check them all, but he's doing that every day at eight o'clock our time. I don't know what that will be your time, but 8 p.m. LinkedIn. Um, yeah, yeah, but it, it's um, yeah, it's Studio Fifty Two is is the name of his Instagram. Um, but yeah, the, the great fun, and I don't always watch them live because you know eight pm sometimes my wife wants to be, you know, in the room eating dinner with her. But uh, but I try and catch them up within the twenty four hours while they're up. Um, yeah, very good, very good stuff. Well, uh, and lots of other lots of other great you know content out there as well. And you know, I mean, Vanish and Ink did that mm. great, you know sort of uh, magic, almost like a convention, wasn't it, really? Yeah. Lots of good stuff getting out there and, you know. Well, we have a lot of uh, those things on our Melbourne Magic Festival website because, obviously, people who are looking forward to booking tickets for the Magic Festival can't get in. There's no tickets yeah. to be sold. But uh, instead, when they go there, they get, uh, like, a, a Netflix of magic. So they uh. the choices they can go and visit and have a look. Uh, so many people have put up... Uh, a lot of people like, like Boris Wilde uh, has put up his full show because he was going to be doing it all this year and now he's not. So he thought, well, I've recorded it. So people might as well watch it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, lots, lots of content. But the other thing is that a lot of people are doing um, sort of like not benefits as such, but they're sort of saying, Hey, we're going to put on a show. You're welcome to come and see it. If you're able to kick a few dollars our way to support us because we're entertainers, we have no income now please do. And a lot of people are jumping yeah. in and doing that and it's fantastic. So uh, it's good to see yeah. people supporting each other. Yeah. Very good. Very good. But thank you again for joining me. Uh, I, I must say goodbye, but it's been fantastic chatting with you and catching up. And uh, I am going to uh, look forward to your book. I'm going to put an order in for it as soon as I sign off. So uh, yeah, maybe I should just start doing pre-orders now just to exactly. make some money. Exactly. <laughs> I'll send you a pre-order now and I expect <laughs> the book on time. <laughs> Yeah, it'll get me to be on time. I just don't know what that time is. <laughs> Thanks for chatting. See you later. No problem. See you later, fella. Bye-bye. Stop.